Jordan Sai, welcome to the show. What's up, man? Thanks for having me. Yeah, no doubt. How are you, brother? I'm good, man. I'm very well. How are you? I'm doing wonderful, man. It's a beautiful day. Well, hey, uh, it's really excited having you on. Um, I have been a follower of your stuff for quite some time, and ironically, uh, you know, we existed together in and around the same area when you were at University of Delaware. So let's let's start there. Let's take you back. Uh, so, what made you want to go to UAD? Um, so what made me want to go? All right. So man, going back to my college days or like pre-college days. So my first choice was actually McGill university, uh, which I did not get into. So I didn't go to McGill. And then my next choice was university of Miami, which I did not get into. Uh, and then I was accepted to university of Maryland, which was my next choice, but I wanted to take a year off between high school and college and, and travel for a year. So uh, I wanted to go to Israel and I, I did that and I volunteered with Holocaust survivors. It was an amazing year. Um, but you Maryland would only accept a six month deferral, not a full year deferral, but university of Delaware did accept a year long deferral. So Delaware was like my fourth choice. I, I wasn't like, I will say when I went to the campus, I was very excited because the campus is beautiful. It's a gorgeous campus. And I remember, you know, being like 18, walking around and they're just like super hot girls all around. And I went on like <laughs> the most beautiful day ever. And like, there were girls out there sunbathing and like, it was just like, this is amazing. So I was very excited, uh, but it was my fourth choice. And, and I also, I, I originally went for exercise science. And they do have a, a very well-known exercise science program, which I was excited about, but I actually ended up getting out of that after like a month and a half anyway. So that's why I originally wanted to go. Yeah. So you started exercise science and then did you go nutrition sciences? Then I went to uh, behavioral health sciences. So more of like a behavioral psychology uh, around around health decisions that people make. Well, what, did, what was it that made you want to pivot? So, so, I mean, there's a long backstory, but I got my first internship at a gym when I was 14. And I, not only was I, I lucky that I got the internship, but I was also lucky because the gym was super science-based, which was, it's, it's rayer now, but even more rayer back then to have a really science-based training facility. And so from 14 years old to 18 years old, all through high school, I was coaching at this amazing, amazing gym. And then when I got to college, I very quickly realized that a lot of these professors, and by a lot of them, I mean all of them who were teaching exercise science had never actually coached anybody. They went from learning about it in a textbook to teaching about it from a textbook. And not never mind a lot of the science and stuff that they were preaching was outdated and old, but it's one thing, even if, even if everything they were teaching was correct, it's one thing to have the knowledge. It's another thing to actually coach someone in person. They are two entirely separate skills and, and knowledge bases. And one of the best things I learned from actually coaching people from 14 to 18 was you could have the perfect program. You could have the perfect meal plan. You could have everything perfect, but if the client doesn't follow it, it means nothing. And that's why after about a month and a half, I was like, I'm wasting my time. Like, th like number one, everything they're saying, like, I don't agree with the vast majority of it too. Like they're, they've never actually coached anybody. So a lot of what they're saying is, is just idiotic. And I realized I needed to understand psychology better and why people are making the decisions they're making. I mean, most people know, and by most people, I mean, all people know they should be exercising. They should be focusing on high quality, nutrient dense foods, but they're not doing it. I mean, even we'll take cigarettes as an example, cigarettes, there's a skull and crossbones on the box. It says, this is going to kill you. And not only do people continue to smoke them, but people right now, someone is buying their first ever box of cigarettes, knowing that it will cause them damage. Why are people making the decisions they're making in regard to their health? And I was like, I need to figure this out so I can actually help them. And so that's why I made the switch to behavioral health and psychology, because I thought it would make a much bigger impact on my client's success. And it absolutely did. Yeah, well, good for you at that age to have that kind of foresight and insight into the realization of what you could do to best serve your clients. I mean, I think, you know, we're at a point where there's just so much information available. Like there's no better example, you know, to your point of the fact that there's this disconnect between what people should know to do or not to do at this point versus what they're actually doing. Like we know that obesity rates are continuing to go up. We know that people are still struggling with even the most basic of, of like, big levers when it comes to nutrition and fitness. So obviously there's behavioral change that is the crux of the issue here. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. Behavior change. And I mean, this is for everything, not even just health and fitness, but like understanding psychology and behavior change, whether you're talking with your child, talking with your spouse, talking with your friends, someone wants to start a business, someone, whatever it is, like behavior change is the root of everything. And once you understand that, then you can start to approach anything you want to achieve from a very different perspective that might help a lot. For sure. Yeah. Now, as part of your time at University of Delaware, you also were on the powerlifting team, correct? I started the powerlifting team. You started the powerlifting team. Okay. I started it with my buddy, Joe Ratteni and my other friend, Nick Busan. We all started it, three of us. Nice. And what was it for you that led you to get into powerlifting? So I was a wrestler. I started wrestling at eight years old and I wrestled from eight years old all the way through high school. And I, I loved wrestling. I still love wrestling, but I was cutting a lot of weight. And during my time interning at this gym, when I was 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, the coaches introduced me to, you know, the big lifts, like barbell lifts, squats, deadlifts, bench press, and then, you know, chin ups, lunges, just like good strength and conditioning. And I just became obsessed with strength and conditioning. I just loved it. I loved strength training. I loved lifting heavy. I loved powerlifting. And by the time I graduated high school, I was like, I love wrestling, but I hate cutting weight. I had severe disordered eating, uh, binge eating and all that because of the wrestling weight cuts. And I decided I wanted to focus more on powerlifting and getting stronger. And uh, I was also like, this will be great because I won't have to cut weight. And then, of course, I ended up having to cut weight and powerlifting as well. But it, it wasn't as as frequent or as intense. The, the, the wrestling weight cuts are every week, sometimes uh, several way times harder. a week way harder, way more difficult. And powerlifting was once every six months, I would cut five or 10 pounds. So it was, it was not a big deal at all. So that's what really got me into it. And then I really wanted to deadlift four times my body weight. That was just a big goal that I had set for myself. And that's, uh, that's how I really got in- invested in powerlifting. And of course, you know, watching Louis Simmons on YouTube, just like he, he was rest in peace. What an amazing man. Like he was so captivating and just watching him at 18, 19, 20 years old. I was like, this guy, he's a genius. And I, he, Louis had this amazing ability of like creating a cult around him. And I, I became part of that cult and I will be until I die. Just like, and so Louis just very much fostered my love for powerlifting as well. Did you primarily tra- uh, train through, uh, like West side methodology? Yes. Yes. So I, uh, I trained at Westside for about four months or so. Um, it was actually crazy. So to show you how bad the the coaching program at University of Delaware was, I got an internship of my own volition at Westside Barbell. So it was about a three month internship. So three months, not four months. And uh, I tra- I moved to Columbus, Ohio during the summer between my freshman and sophomore year. And I stayed there for three months, competed under Louis. My squat, bench press, and deadlift in- increased 300 pounds in those three months. 300 pounds. And I trained twice, uh, uh, 11 times a week, two times a day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, one time a day, Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday. And I was with Louis every single day, seven days a week, multiple times a day, studying. I, got, I took the Westside Barbell certification. I got it. And as part of the University of Delaware curriculum, especially for strength and conditioning, which was my minor, you have to get an internship. And I said, hey, like I interned uh, with Louis Simmons. Could this count as my internship? And they said, no, he's not. uh, (laughs) It it doesn't count. And I said, well, why not? And they said, well, you did it in your sophomore year and you need to do it in your senior year. And I was like, so it doesn't count as me. And they no, they wouldn't let it work. And I was like, that's so pedantic. It was awful. And one of the funniest things, so I started writing articles in 2011 for my dorm room and and at University of Delaware from, and uh, what is it? Something, Dwayne Reed, Dwayne Reed dorm. And I, you know, after interning at Westside, I wrote an article about the Westside barbell conjugate method, which was like, it was, it became one of the most highly sought after articles and most referenced articles in the world. And it was so funny because we started learning about conjugate in class and strength and conditioning. And this is after my internship, after the article, all that. And the professor, I hated this guy. He was such a piece of shit. He, <laughs> he said something wrong about conjugate. He said it was flat out wrong. And I said it. I was like, I raised my hand. I was like, I actually think that's incorrect, blah, 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 blah. And he knew I had trained at Westside. He was the one that denied the Westside as the, the, as the internship, all this stuff. And, and we got an argument about it. And he's like, you know what? Let me look it up. And he Googles it. 
and my article is the first one to come up in the middle of class. And like, he immediately, he got like red in the face. He was so pissed off. Like, and it turned out of course that I was right, but like, it was, it was, there was a lot of ego in the, with the professors at university of Delaware and a lot of, of just incorrect teaching. And which is one of the issues I have with tenure. Um, and I have a lot of family, my whole family is professors, doctors, lawyers, and like they're tenured, but the best professors are the ones that don't use tenure as a justification to stop learning. And that's just, that's what I've seen a lot at UD. Well, and as you pointed out earlier, like the, the, the science is always delayed, right? It's always a, delayed by a decade or so in terms of what's actually being publicized and taught inside of the universities, not just from a curriculum standpoint, but also like from the educational perspective of the professors. Cause as you mentioned, like not all of them want to update their software. They've learned something in 1970 it worked back then to some degree or another. And then they, they just, they keep going with it, you know? So yeah. it's, it's hard, you know, they hit that tenure and they're like, okay, cool. Like I'm, I'm sound. I don't need to, to go any further. I actually had a very similar experience in college. I went to school for exercise science about 45 minutes North at Westchester university, just outside of university of Delaware. And it was the same yeah. thing. Like I had ambitions and hopes of starting a gym and uh, I was, I had joined a strength and conditioning facility in a CrossFit gym while I was in my exercise science program. And the two just did not tango well together. I was like, I'm like, listen, like I got, I got women over here that are 40 that are overhead squatting 135, like looking yeah. great. And then I've got my, my professor who is like deathly afraid of someone overhead squatting. And I'm like, the, how does this mix? It was the most bizarre experience. Like it was like, I was living in two different worlds. Yeah, it, it was. It was legitimately two different worlds. And, and one world was practical application. And another world was people just like spouting off stuff that they were told when they were in school. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you, you always credit a friend, I believe it is, uh, that kind of nudged you to start your website and start pu publishing your own blog. Uh, mm -hmm. was, was being an entrepreneur something that you ever had on your sites? No, no. So I'll start with the friend's name is JC Dean. Um, he, he actually, so when I went to Westside, he was a mentor of mine and, and I was at Westside for a couple of weeks and JC texted me and he was like, dude, where are you? And I was like, I'm at Westside Barber. He's like, shut up. He's like, what are you doing there? I was like, I got an internship. I'm training here for three months. He's like, bro, you need to start a website. And you know, I was 20 or 21. I was like, I don't know how to do that. He's like, hold on. An hour later, he emails me the information for my own website, sciatfitness.com. Like he just, he made it. He made it and it was like a, a shitty WordPress template. It wasn't like well-made, but he's the reason I had a website at 21 years old. He like made it, got the login information, got the hosting, all that stuff. Um, as far as an entrepreneur, to be very honest with you, I don't even consider myself an entrepreneur now. Um, and I hate it when coaches call themselves entrepreneurs because I think there's nothing wrong with calling yourself an entrepreneur, but what I've noticed a huge shift in the industry towards coaches, instead of wanting to be a coach, they want to be an entrepreneur. They want to like, Oh yeah, like I have my own business. And, and it's the ego aspect of like, yeah, I'm, I'm my own man or I'm my own woman and I make my own wealth and da da da. It's like, you're a fucking personal trainer is what you are. And you should be prideful of that. You should be proud that your job is to improve the health of your clients, which in turn improves the health of their family unit, which in turn helps improve the health of us society as a whole. So I never call myself an entrepreneur because I think it sounds like a douchebag thing to say, not to mention I have one business. It's like, I'm a coach. That's what I do. I'm not opening seven different businesses or, or a hundred. It's like, I think entrepreneurs are a different breed where they love the process of starting a business from the ground up. They build it, sell it, move on. Maybe, maybe they don't, but they have multiple things going on and they love the process of starting businesses. If you're a personal trainer and your business is your coaching, like you're a personal trainer and you, you happen to run your own business, but that doesn't make you an entrepreneur. Just, it makes you a, a, a coach who runs the gym yourself or runs the personal training business yourself. So I hate it when people, when coaches say I'm an entrepreneur. No, you're not. You're a fucking ace certified personal trainer. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a really fascinating perspective. Cause like for, for me coming from somebody that at 22 started a gym, I think one of the struggles we always have is like when to put time in the business versus on the business, right? Because mm -hmm. like someone that comes in passionate about their craft, they want to spend their entire day coaching. I right? feel mm -hmm. like if you ever want to grow and have coaches underneath of you, like you have to pay attention to the business. A hundred percent. That's exactly right. And it's a tough balance to strike. Oh man, it's brutal. It's really brutal. And it's one of the reasons why I tell coaches, I'm like, listen, if you, 
if you love coaching and you just want to be a coach, I wouldn't open a gym unless you're okay giving that portion. Like, for example, Eric Cressy, he's a perfect example of this. Eric Cressy, a great mentor of mine, um, one of the greatest strength and conditioning coaches of all time. Um, when he started, when he opened his gym, he had a, has a partner, Pete Dupuy, who runs the business side of it. Whereas Eric was on the floor and he was coaching and they're equal partners in the business, but Eric knew he loved coaching. Pete knew he loved the business side of it. So if, if you love coaching, I think it's probably better for most people to maybe like rent out space at a gym and not have to worry about the overhead, not have to worry about buying all the equipment, not have to worry about plumbing issues, not have to worry about, you know, if there's a weather issue, what are you going to do? Not have to worry about paying your employees, not have to worry about rent. It's just like, yeah, you rent out space and you coach your clients and then you go home. But if you want to open a gym and like, and do the business side of it, well, that's fine, but it's a different thing than coaching. Yeah. It's a different animal. Um, and you know, I, I guess looking back, I'm like, I wish I would have had like in hindsight, I wish I would have had the foresight to be able to go and self-select for somebody that was like incredibly entrepreneur minded and like had yeah. the business side taken care of. But like, that's the reality when you're, when you're 22, it's really hard to make that kind of decision. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I think you and I came up at a, at like a, a pivotal point in the fitness industry. Oh, absolutely. Like right. As online started to become a thing. And before that it was, you either own a gym or you don't. And that was it. And it was like, so we're going to open a gym because that's what everyone before me has done. And that's how I've been taught that like that we're going to be successful. And right at the time that you and I were like starting to be professionals in the industry, online became a thing. And then, or like you could do a hybrid of online and in person or whatever it is. So it was a, a very unique time for us. We, we came in at the end of an era and at the beginning of an era. Absolutely. Well, and I think, you know, because of that, we also saw the strength and conditioning side of the, the world get really shaken up because CrossFit kind of took off in 2011 or so. Mm -hmm. And you saw all these ideologies being able to basically battle it out with each other. But also at the same time, people being able to scale their businesses online at a rate that you never could pull off even five years before that. Oh, yeah. Not, not even close. Not, and it was funny because I, I, Opened up a, business, a gym in Boston briefly, and then I, I got out of it after about six months. I just the, the co-owner just we didn't really jibe, and I, I was thinking about opening up another gym. And I, I got on the phone with um oh man I'm gonna forget his name, but he's he's an amazing amazing uh, business guy within the fitness industry. I feel bad that I'm not gonna be able to give him credit, but I told I had an online business at that point. I started my online business when I was in college, and so he was asking about it, asking what I was doing, and it, I was by no means killing it. But I was doing well for like a 22 year old kid just out of college and and running running almost everything for my computer and I and he said why do you want a gym and I was like I just feel like that's what I'm supposed to do and thank God he said please don't he was like <laughs> he was like please don't he was like he's like you are in the prime position to absolutely kill it with everything he's like just keep doing what you're doing and it's going to be amazing and I'm so blessed that they, he was willing to get on a call with me and talk with me and it was all for free I didn't even pay him it just took a call with me and he was in my ear and he said, please don't. And this is like the number one guy to help. He, he helped Eric Cressy build his gym. He helped people build gyms all over the world. And he was like, don't do it. It was, it was such a unique thing to hear. Oh my gosh. Like, well, it just, just thinking about how untethered you are to the overhead by yeah. starting online. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I know there's probably a million other obstacles and cons that are associated with the online presence, but like, Man, like not not having to have that, like okay, like eight thousand dollars is due come come yeah. Monday. You better figure your shit out, dude. Overhead is the cost of your domain. It's like the cost of your your web hosting. That's your overhead. It's like it's, and yes, there are other obstacles and and other difficulties. But the not having to work, dude. When I opened up the gym in Boston, if you want to hear a disgusting story, I'll tell you this. Yeah, this, this is awful. So opened up a gym in Boston uh, with, with a guy who, even though we didn't drive well, I still respect him a great deal. And and if I saw him in person, I'd give him a big hug. Um, it was in the financial district of Boston. And I was doing like opening the gym at like five or six in the morning. Like we would alternate. So I was doing like the early morning classes some days. And I went in one day and it was the winter freezing in Boston, like absolutely devastatingly cold. And it's dark. And, and, 
there's a lot of homeless people in the financial district. And they would often like go into the dwelling where our door was to like to get out of the cold and like just to be able to sleep there. And so every morning I'd have to, you know, get one of them out and and, because they would be sleeping there. So I'd have to wake them up and our clients would be waiting right there and they would see the homeless person and they wouldn't want to touch them or anything like that. I walk in the gym after moving one of the, this homeless this homeless guy out of the way, walk in the gym and I'm like, oh, it smells like shit, like literal shit. It smelled like poop. And I was like, what is that? And the lights in the gym are all off. It's like five or six in the morning. I forget which one. And I'm walking around in the gym and it's just like, it's just, it's not going away. I'm like, what is that smell? So I turn on all the lights and I realized I stepped in human shit that the guy <laughs> had, had pooped right outside the door and I tracked his feces all over the gym on the turf. And and like, dude, it was in the, I was wearing Timberland boots and it was in the creases of the Timberland boots. And I, I had to clean the whole gym of this guy's literal fecal matter. (laughs) And and I was just like, what I, I, I don't want to be doing this. A problem that's almost impossible to happen on an online. (laughs) (laughs) I got I got a six month old daughter. I clean up her poop all the time, but like, I'm not stepping in it and tracking it around the apartment. That's for sure. I'm sure. And if you are, it probably wouldn't be as bad. <laughs> it wouldn't even be anywhere close to as bad. Not at all. <laughs> well, hey, let's dive into some of your advice that you give online. So I, I've always seen you as kind of the person that gives this like raw, unedited advice that is both practical, but also in the face of what I would consider to be like some of the extremist positions, the absolutists in the nutrition and fitness space. Like what was it for you that kind of lended you to taking that approach? Oh man, I think, so there's a lot, but number one, in terms of like the, the un, like the, the no BS style, I think that just is is who I am and how I was brought up. Uh, You know, I was brought up outside Boston, Massachusetts, East coast. Like it's funny. East Coast people, my audience has more East Coast people than anywhere else, whether, you know, I have people from all over the world and it's a blessing, but East Coast people, they get me better than West Coast people. East Coast people, they tend to enjoy the the blunt, straightforward stuff. The West Coast people often leave comments being like, you're a rude, da, 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 da. Like they get very offended more easily. Um, so it, part of it is just how I was brought up and then more just like in your face, fuck you. I don't need, I don't care, but whatever. It's just like a very Boston mentality. Yeah. It's also just my personality. It's how I was raised. Um, also for me growing up and, and just, I think anyone in the fitness industry, and I'm sure this is true in many industries, but especially fitness, there's just so much contradictory information and there's so many myths. And the more I learned, the more I realized these myths are just like, they're made up from a marketing perspective. Like people just made them up because it went along with either a fallacy they believed, like the naturalistic fallacy, like whatever it is. Um, And every time I learned something else was a myth, I was just blown away. I was like, I can't believe that I was scared to eat carbs. I can't believe this or that. And so I was like, you know what? That's what the majority of my content is going to be around, like uh, like a, a lot of myth busting and making this as simple and easy and straightforward as possible. Because I think it's difficult enough as is with all of the right information, with all of the knowledge, it's difficult enough as is to often motivate yourself and stay consistent, never mind dealing with all of these horseshit myths and, and fallacies. So I was just like, you know what, I'm going to make this as simple as possible remove all the myths, just give you everything that you need, which is fortunately much more simple than marketers would have you believe. But I just sort of fell into doing that because that's what I was most passionate about. Yeah. I tell our clients all the time. I'm like, look, like there's a line in the sand. And on one half, there are people that are trying to convince you to stick to the basics. And on the other half, there's people trying to distract you from them. And Mm. those people are trying to sell you shit. I love that. And it's just, it's an easy way of like a distinction to say like, these are the people you need to pay attention to. And these are the people you need to ignore and block. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, That's a cause great it is, it's, it's so it. hard, right? Like people, cause here's the thing, like even in the context of the right advice, it can just be the wrong time. Yeah, that's exactly right. So like a lot of times people will come to me with advice and I'm like, yeah, that's right. But not for you right now. You yes. know? And so then you got on top of that pi- people piling in and they're like, eat keto. <laughs> you know? Like, no, <laughs> no, no, not now. You know, like it's just, yeah, it's all over the place. So, you know, it's, it's funny as a coach, like how do we, how do we make sure that we're not only helping people kind of swim through the misinformation and disinformation all the while also making sure that we're helping people pull on the, the biggest levers possible? Like, you know what I mean? How do we, how do we w- work that out? 
it, man, that's that's the billion dollar question right there. Like, how, how do you do it? I think I think we have to do it progressively in the same way. You know, you have someone walk in the gym. They've never worked out in their life. They're 350 pounds. You're not going to have them do snatches. You're not going to have them do deficit deadlifts versus bands. You're going to be like, hey, like, let's just let's maybe just get you to walk around the gym. Let's just walk. Let's just walk. Get you comfortable in here. Like, have you meet some of the members, right? Like meeting the members. That's not necessarily part of their their physical fitness, but it would definitely make them feel more comfortable in the gym, which then will contribute to them being more likely to go there on a consistent basis if they feel like they're welcome there, if they feel like they're not being judged, which will then encourage them to try new things in front of other people that they might not have done. So in the same way you would treat a client progressively, and then from there, then, all right, cool, we're going to do some kettlebell deadlifts, and then we're going to go to some trap bar deadlifts, we're going to do some sumo, then it progress, 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 progress. You start with the lowest common denominator, the, the lowest lowest hanging fruit and you build up. I think that's what you do online as well. It's listen, I'm going to start here. I'm going to, I'm going to bust these myths and then I'm going to give you practical advice to go from. And that's sort of my methodology when I, when I'm making content online is obviously there are some people who've been following me for 10 years and other people have been following me for seven minutes. And so those two, those two people might need vastly different things, but I'm going to do my best to provide as much as I can for each of those individuals. And some pieces of content will be more directed at the beginner. Some pieces of content will be more directed at them more in, in, advanced or intermediate, whatever it is. But as long as you're, you're telling them the truth and you're making it as simple as possible for them to take action on that truth, I think you're, you're going to be doing very, very well. Do you feel like at some point there's a hurdle that you, once you get people over, you're like, okay, they're bought in. Yeah. And I think it's different for everyone. Um, I, I think the biggest hurdle that most people struggle with is actually believing in their ability to succeed. That's, that is the biggest hurdle by far. And I think the, the biggest reason that most people quit is because they think that whatever they're doing isn't working or that it's just not going to be possible for them. And they've tried a million times. And it's just not going to work. And that's why I think most people quit over and over and over again and continuously fail because they don't get to a point in which they truly believe that they're going to be able to do it. And so, um, I think that that's the number one hurdle. And if you can get them to actually believe in themselves, then the rest is the rest is just like watching watching it go crazy, like watch them try different things and having fun with it and finding what they're passionate about and, and watching themselves grow and succeed and get stronger, more conditioned, more flexible and more confident. But if you don't get to the point in which you believe you can succeed, it's going to be very difficult to stay consistent. Yeah. And to that psychological point you made about, you know, introducing a member or, you know, somebody to the other clients, you know, in this case, it's like stacking wins. It's like, yeah. let's, let's come up with an actionable game plan that I know for a fact, it feels really small, trivial and stupid to you. But if I can get you to prove over the course of two weeks or a month that like you can keep stacking wins, it's like, that's the momentum people need to get over that belief hurdle. Dude, a hundred percent. Well said. It's, it's, uh, you know, we talk about hitting personal records, PRs in the gym. It's like one of the greatest things about the conjugate method and the way Louis structured his, his form of conjugate is that you can hit a new personal record every day. And I've taken that and applied it to every aspect of life, not just strength training, not just being in the gym, but going cool. You walked around the gym and you met three new people before, like you were sitting on your couch and you're like, I don't want to go to the gym because people are, are, are going to judge me. You just got up, you went to the gym, you walked around, you met new people. That's a huge win. That's a personal record. And and getting people to see and recognize these wins, I think it is a severely underrated aspect of becoming a coach. You have to teach people how to find wins. They need to look for them under every rock and around every corner. You need to find the wins that you're having because the more wins you have, just like you said, the more consistent you're going to be. So we need to teach people how do you find those wins. Yeah, and as, as a framing tool, like even at the highest of levels, the elite of the elite, somebody that has a – someone that hits a 500-pound deadlift PR didn't jump from 300. It was an incremental improvement from like 485, right? So even for them, it was an incremental small win, right? It right. might look large to you. You see the whole mountain, but we don't realize is like they were just before it, right? They, they, they had worked incrementally to get to that, that point. Andy Bolton's the only one who deadlifted the first time he picked up a bar. He, anyone else, like, yeah, it's incremental. It's exactly <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's a freak in every, in every yeah. industry, man. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I, you know, we were talking earlier about, like, kind of coaching and, like, what's important for the coaches. to Like, sometimes there's this disconnect between 
what coaches experience and what clients experience, because like we are so far removed in terms of our ability to be empathetic towards the average person, because for many coaches, they have just led a life where they it, fitness came more naturally to them. Just like finance can come more naturally to some people. Maybe someone has a high IQ and education falls in that department. But as coaches and as gym owners, I think one of the most important things is that we all go through some sort of major life event or have something happen in our lives where fitness can no longer be our number one priority. Because mm -hmm. then what we see is we start to increase our level of empathy for people where fitness has never been their number one priority. And I think this was something that I saw a lot, especially with coaches in their early 20s, where it's like, I don't understand why you don't want to go to the gym all day. It's like, because they have a job, bro. Like, they have a family, bro. Like, they have stuff to do. Like, what do you mean you don't understand why they don't want to work out all day? You know, so would yeah. you say that, like, your own personal life experiences have, have helped you be more empathetic towards your clientele? A hundred percent. I mean, you know, it's funny. I think most coaches, I don't know about nowadays, but I think because it's only in the, in the last few years that becoming a, a coach has just skyrocketed in popularity. And, and I know like when you and I got into it, at least for me, you know, my family was not happy about it. They did not want me to be a personal trainer. They were like, what are, what are you doing? Like my whole family, doctors, lawyers, professors, like superintendents, they, they're academics and they're like, you want to be a personal trainer? I was like, yeah. And, and I know a lot of us, definitely me and potentially you as well. I thought I wanted to work with high level athletes. I was like, I want to work with high level athletes because in my mind, I was like, they're more committed. They're going to like, I was, it's going to be so much more fun. And I worked with high level athletes, but I actually am far more passionate about working with everyday people, moms and dads, husbands and wives, people who work regular full-time exhausting jobs uh, or stay at home moms who are also have an exhausting job. Like I had, I have way much more passion for that population than I ever have for a uh, high level athlete population for many reasons, but not least of which I think those are the people who need it the most. Those are the people who, who need the help the most. It's going to have the biggest impact. Taking someone who is an everyday average Joe or Jane from barely ever working out, if at all, to working out consistently three times a week for 45 minutes a session and getting their deadlift stronger and getting them more confident and capable, you see a far greater benefit to them and their family and their community than you do improving someone's 40-yard dash who's already an elite athlete or taking someone from a 315 to 325 bench press or whatever it is. It's just like the, 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 the overall net impact on the individual and their family and society as a whole is so gargantuanly impacted from taking an everyday person and doing that than, than it is from an, an elite athlete. And that's why I have so much more passion for it. And if you're going to work with everyday people, you got to have a lot of empathy and understand like this is not their life. And not only is it not their life, but they might not like it at all. And this is another issue that I have with coaches. They always say, you need a, you need a, find what you love with health and fitness. I hate when they say that. And I'm always like, I can almost tell that you've never worked with a lot of people because if you have, then you would know that there are going to be a fair number of people who will always hate working out. No matter what, they will always hate it. They will fuck hate every minute of it from start to finish, whether it's dance, whether it's CrossFit, whether it's powerlifting, whether it's just overall strength training, whether it's Zumba, whether it's Pilates, they'll just always fucking hate it, but they need to do it no matter what, even if they hate it. So my advice, rather than saying like, you need to find something you love, it's like, listen, find something you hate the least. And if you end up loving it, great, that's fantastic. But if you don't, you still got to fucking do it. So how do we get you to do it over and over and over again? Yeah, I think you you made a post a while ago about this. And it, 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 basically, it basically broke it down into like, like, intentional suffering versus like yes. indirect suffering, something to that effect yes. where it's like, like you can choose to suffer through exercise, even though you may not like it at all, or eventually you will suffer for not having exercised. It's exactly right. It's a hundred percent accurate. Yeah. Now I have to ask, so you, you spent quite a bit of time working with Gary V and I, the, the thing that interests me the most in that experience for you is did you learn more from him in terms of productivity and, and those sort of things from him directly? Or was it from the indirect nature of just being around him? Yeah. So I get this question all the time and from, from a lot of coaches. And 
I always will ask the coach back, like, listen, do, have you ever worked with a lawyer or a doctor or a, a finance expert, or whatever? And like, yeah, of course, because, you know, they eventually work with those people. Like during the hour coaching session, are you asking for advice on like, you know, finance or it's like, no, of course not, because it's their fucking hour. They're paying for it. And an hour isn't even that much time anyway. And like 15 minutes of those are going to be taken up with something else and da 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 da. And like, then they have to leave early because they got a rush or they come in late, whatever it is. So with Gary during our workouts, the, I could always tell when he didn't want to work out because he would ask about my business. That's how I knew he didn't <laughs> want to work out that day. Like he'd be like, uh, he'd be like, Hey, tell, tell me about your business. How's it going? And I'd always be like, well, we won't talk about that now. We'll wait until after the workout because I knew that was his way of trying to get out of working out that day. Right. So the, the main way that I learned was being a part of his ecosystem looking at his Google calendar and seeing how fucking packed his day is from 5 a.m. until 1 a.m. every day. I mean, this guy, he has everything in his calendar from his workout to his shower, to his drive to the office. He has meetings throughout the drive to the office. Like this guy goes, if you go out to lunch with your friends, you're not working as hard as Gary. If you, if you just take like a day, I'm just going to have lunch or, you know, I'm going to take a nap or maybe I'll sleep in or nope, you're not working. Like Gary doesn't waste a second. So I learned really just work harder. If you want to succeed, that's really it. It's just work harder, take less breaks, take fewer naps, just work harder. Now, the other thing I learned though, and this is equally important is I don't want that life. I like taking naps. I like going out to lunch with friends. I like going on a random walk with my wife and daughter in the middle of the day. Like I enjoy that. And this is why I don't call myself an entrepreneur because like, I think if I was a true entrepreneur, like a true, like it was in my blood, I'd be like, I just want to work. I want to work. I want to build this. I want to build that. And I have friends, not just Gary, but I have friends who that's their, that's their instinct. That's their blood. I have a buddy here in Dallas. His name is Rogers. This guy's a beast. He doesn't stop. He goes, he goes, he goes, he goes. It's like, he doesn't want to take a break. It's, it's, it's what he loves to do. So for me, one of the best lessons I learned from being around Gary was knowing I don't want that life. I, I want to go on vacation. I want to relax. I want to do this. Like, and I want to, I want to, I want to work so I can live. I don't want to live so I can work. Yeah, amen. I mean, I think what you you noted there, which is really important, is just about intentionality. Like, and and being brutally honest with yourself because we all fall. It's it's the same way that there's vanity metrics in fitness. You know, everyone wants the the, the ripped six pack and big muscles until they realize the amount of work and trade offs you know expected to be able to accomplish something like that, and then eh, never mind. You know, it's yeah, like, exactly. The, the business side is the same thing, man. I don't know. Yeah, working eighty hours, hundred hours a week is not my not my gig. No, and and to be fair, like I had periods of my life where I did that, especially when I was coaching him. Sure, and yeah. and that has paid off now on the back end because of it. But I don't want that to be my life. Like I'm like I, I did it for a few years, and that's enough. It's sort of like there were p periods in my in my career where I was shredded to bits, and I hated every second of it. I was like, I, I wasn't as flexible with my nutrition. I had super low body fat. Ironically, I was way more insecure when I had super low body fat than now that I have a little bit more body fat. Um, so it's it's one of those things. Sometimes you have to experience it in order to know whether or not that's for you. But yeah, I mean, I think a, a lot of people are are very um, very wooed by the idea of being an entrepreneur and working nonstop. And I'm just like, man, if I look at the longest living populations in the world. They're not entrepreneurs. That's for sure. <laughs> like, no. they're, they're not the people who are grinding 16, 18 hours a day. It's, you know, it's people who are like, I'll work a little bit. Then you know, I'll have a glass of wine. We'll go on a walk with the family. Like they, they work here and there. It's just, it's not the wealthiest people in the world. And it's not the poorest people in the world. It's the people right in the middle, which, you know, shocker, the middle ground. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Now, I, I had to ask because I'm sure that that was like a big transformative experience for you. Now, were, were there any other things in your kind of ascension between Delaware and today where you had like a an oh shit moment where you just kind of took a moment to like look at everything you had accomplished and built and went like, wow, how did I get here? Uh, pff, um, yeah, I mean, all the time. All, all the time. <laughs> I, mean, I, I remember. So I remember. I did not grow up with money at all. I didn't grow up like money was always a big issue in my family. It was, it was always a, a difficult conversation and it was always a conversation that was being had. It was just like, no matter what, it was like, we don't have money for this. We don't have money for that. Da, 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 da. It was always a huge stress point in my family. 
and I, I had a general idea of how much my parents made put together and individually. And I remember when I, when I first made like $80,000 in a year, I broke down crying. I was like, this is more than either of my parents made annually. And, and I was just like, I, I felt guilty for it. I felt like em, embarrassed in some ways. Um, I felt it, it was just, it, it was, it wasn't, I, I didn't feel prideful. I felt it was like bad. It was, it was, it was a weird feeling, but to also know that I had done that on my own was like, it was inspiring and all of that. But it was, that was a big, Oh shit moment. Like, how did this happen? Um, especially because making more money wasn't the primary goal. The goal, like when I started my website, I didn't even know an online business was possible. I just wanted to write articles and help people. You know, when I trained at Westside, I, I was very close to just dropping out of school and staying at Westside. I, you know, <laughs> I fell under that spell and I, I, I want to say there in every lifter there, whether it was Brandon Lilly or AJ Roberts or any of the other lifters, they were, they were all like, yeah, you should drop out and just stay here and lift all of them. And the only person who wanted me to go back to school was Louie. Wow. Louie pulled, and dude, I almost got like west side tattooed on my chest like i almost like <laughs> dude, I'm, i was close like when i say i was close, i was on the edge that would have been I, great to show your teacher bro could you imagine <laughs> like west side for life motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> louis pulls me aside one day near the end of of my time there i think he knew that i wanted to stay and he's like you got to go back to school and and i couldn't believe it i thought of everyone there louis would be the one that would want me to stay and he, and I was like, why? And he goes, listen, I'm, I'm tattooed head to toe. I've spent time in prison. I, I, I don't speak the ways, the way academics speak. He goes, I'll never be able to speak at a college presentation. Like the no one will want me to come speak for them. He's like, the reason that I, I wanted you to come is because you know how to speak to people. He's like, you know how to speak, you know how to learn and you know how to educate. He's like, I brought you here to teach you what I know. So then you can teach other people the right way to train. And he's like, you're going to go back to school. You're going to get your education and it might be, you might learn all the wrong stuff, but you know the right way to train now. So use what you have to then be able to educate others. So, uh, I mean, that, that was a, a huge moment for me to realize like the, the opportunities that I had. I think you just got the most humble 15 seconds of Louis Simmons entire <laughs> life. Like he's such a brass in your face, like no bullshit kind of guy. And I've, that's an amazing story, man. I've, well, I've, the I've, thing I've, is, you know, Louis was that way online and he was, he was that way in person too, in, in many ways, but bro, he, he was like a father to me, man. Like I, I came out there, he wouldn't let me pay for a meal. Not one meal. He would take me out to lunch every day. He'd be like, no, you're not paying. This is on me. He's like, he wouldn't let me pay for the certification. He's like, no, I've got this. He, he would get protein supplements. No, you get this for free. And I was just a random kid from nowhere who came out to learn. He, did, he would sit down with me every day, and I, he would, I would be able to ask him questions from the books that I was reading that he gave me. Like Every day he spent with me for three months, and he got nothing out of it other than he knew that I would be able to go back and continue to educate and, and use the knowledge that, that I took from him. And there was no, like, you have to say you're a West Side coach and you learned this from Louis. He was like, no, just take this knowledge for free. And so while he is very brash, and he, or he was very brash, and he was very in your face, he was also one of the most loving humans I've ever met in my life. And he's probably looking down right now being like, ah, shut up. No, I'm not. Da, 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 da. But like he had the biggest heart of anyone I've ever met. And like he, he truly loved with, with an enormity that it's, it's hard to describe. I love that. I wish this message was like put, put right in the middle of the West Side documentary. Just to yeah. use the shit out of everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I think that would make West Side, that documentary – more accurate because you know a lot of the guys at Westside they hated that documentary. It didn't it didn't fully encapsulate Westside in the ways that those who train there know it. Yeah, I mean, look, clearly he was a charismatic man. Like he grew that team to be to do things and be something that had never existed before. It was on it was unprecedented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, that's exactly right. So just recently you became a father. How's that changed yeah. life? Man, it's the best. It's so funny because. Every parent says that. Oh, it's the best thing ever. It's like, it's just, I think the best way I can describe it is my heart now lives outside of my body. It's just, it's my heart belongs to my daughter. She has 100% of it. 
And uh, if my mom would always say, "You're only a parent is only ever as happy as their their saddest child," and uh, you know she's only six months. So, but if she's sick and she's got a stuffy nose, I hate it. If if she's happy and laughing, then I'm happy and laughing. Like it's just it's the best, and I'm just constantly thinking about her all the time. That's amazing. I got eleven days left, and then oh uh, really? Oh, that's amazing. the party, man. Yeah, I'm so excited. You no know, boy or girl. A uh, girl. Yeah. Oh, that dude, that's super exciting. Yeah. You might be the last podcast in, during the before phase. So yeah, man, I, I'm so happy for you. It's like, listen, I'm, I'm not very experienced. I'm only barely six months into it, but you are about to, to experience a level of love that it's just, it's, you can't even articulate it. It's, it's funny. I'm not, I'm not a crier. I've never been a crier my whole life. I've just, I've just never been a crier. And it's not like I try and suppress it. I've just, the, the, emotion or the, the act of crying very rarely, if ever happens to me. Um, and then as soon as I had my daughter, that completely changed. Now I cry all the time for no reason. Just, I, I don't, you know, people talk about the hormonal changes that women have, which are clearly yeah. drastic beyond measure when, you know, through pregnancy, it's, it's insane. Um, Speaking of empathy for a clientele yeah. base. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Watching oh my. my wife go through this. I, I have never gained more empathy for like yes. a, a, a person going through a certain phase of their life than watching my wife go through nine months of pregnancy. So true. So dude, it's, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable to watch that, that process and, and to watch them go through it and, and wait until you see her give birth. It's going to be fucking insane. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, holy so I shit. hear man. All my yes. friends, all my friends that have like, I, I have like five friends that all had kids in the last year. And yeah. Like they come back to me, like they're ready to tell me a war story. Dude, <laughs> that's like, exactly get ready, right. Get ready. I'm like, All yeah, right. it's, it's a fucking battle. And like I, I, my job that was given to me was like I have to be there to support and motivate and like care for and whatever that capacity that means for, for your wife. And uh, yeah, it, it was it was like a battlefield with the best ending ever. Thank God. Yeah. Well, I am fully ready to embrace that. Well, uh, Jordan, tell everyone um, what you're working on now. Is there anything uh, up and coming for Sciat Fitness? Uh, it's funny. No, nope. Just <laughs> same old, same, same old, <laughs> same old, same old. And it was funny. I was just presenting at a conference in Vegas for coaches two days ago, and someone, one of the coaches, was like, "How, how do you, how do you?" post like the same time and say the same things over and over and over again, even though, you know, it's really boring. And I was like, everything is boring. Like most of life is boring. If you're always searching out something that's, bo that's not boring, then odds are you're not being consistent with anything. I think social media, it's so easy to get caught up in, in, oh, a life is always supposed to be crazy and amazing and fun and spontaneous and new. And it's like, the most successful people I know do the same shit over and over and over and over and over and over nonstop. And that's why they're successful. And like, there are moments in life that are very exciting and very, very new and all of that. But if you want to be very good at, it, at what you're doing, you do the same thing nonstop. And so yeah. I've got nothing new on the horizon. I'm just uh, excited to be able to do what I do and also be able to live and, and, and experience my family and, and hopefully continue to grow it. I love it, man. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like when we're talking to our clients, very rarely ever are we going to give them a piece of new advice that's going to change their world. It's usually just reminding them of shit. Yeah. And even like exercise program design, good strength training is doing the same 15 to 20 exercises over and over and over again until you die. Like yep. <laughs> that's what good strength training is. It's one of my favorite quotes from Ben Bruno. It's like, that's what good strength training is. You do the same exercises. Oh, like, Cool. You do a dumbbell row. Cool. Add a pause. You want to, all right. Cool. Dumbbell row. Like make a slow eccentric. Do dumbbell row. Like okay. Cool. Like we'll do like a, a constant tension rep. Still a fucking dumbbell row. It's like it's the same. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the same fucking thing over and over and over and over and over again. And you're gonna do dumbbell rows from when you start strength training until the day when you stop strength training. It's that's just it's the same shit. And it's boring. And you can find ways to try and make it less boring. But it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> well, hey, no, I really do appreciate you hopping on. This was a lot of fun. Uh, tell the audience where they can uh, find you and learn more about you. Yeah, if you if you Google my name, Jordan Syatt, S Y A T T, you'll, I'm on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and a podcast, whatever platform you listen on or, or watch. Like I'm on the platform. So uh, I want to say thank you, brother. I appreciate you. It's uh, 
it's cool to, to talk to you now and to, to hang out and sort of reminisce on, on UD and all of that, even though if they hear this, they're probably going to be pissed at me. But um, I appreciate <laughs> you, and, and I'm super, super excited for you and your family. And if I can help with anything, do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, seriously, I mean that. It's an open offer. Anything I can do to help, don't hesitate. And uh, God bless, and, and, and good luck with everything. Yeah, no doubt. Hey, thanks so much again for hopping on. Of course.